Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. There you go. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Everyone's a special guest. I'm joined by my good friend at Mason, Joe DeLuna. Now, uh, just going into this topic, we have so many different things. It's probably going to be the most random conversation that we have. But um, this gentleman uh, is doing great things at the Mason community. Um, Really, you know, someone that I considered a campus partner, a campus uh, collaborator, and I just said, man, you know what? I'll, I'll get you on the podcast and we'll figure out what we talk about when we figure it out uh, on the show. But before I get into that, uh, Joe, give the listeners a little bit of a background about who you are. Yeah. Well, uh, Phil, thanks for having me on. I was really excited when you offered me a time to talk with you and your listeners. Uh, I, I, I like podcasts. I'm trying to get into them more. So I appreciate contributing to this world of podcasting. Uh, but yeah, a little about me. Uh, you can call me Joe. I'm Joseph DeLuna. I use he, him pronouns. I currently work at Mason in the Office of New Student and Family Programs as the Assistant Director of Orientation and New Student Programs. A lot of words to equal. I assist with getting students coming into Mason from admission into their first year experience. I work directly with students in our office. So my primary role is working with, we call them orientation leaders. Uh, so a lot of you may know what those are. You may remember your orientation leader. You may have been one or you may have hated one, the one that you had or whatever. You know, they're always so bubbly and excitable. But I mean, I, I think that's why, Phil, you know, we're in this work to to be welcoming and to be exciting and bubbly for new students and families because we do serve different types of families as well. So that's kind of what I do at Mason. I've been there since 2017. A little about me personally, I'm a Floridian through and through, though with everything that's been going on in Florida for the past year, I don't know <laughs> if I like to claim Florida anymore, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I do consider it home. Uh, my, my parents live there. One of my brothers still lives there. Uh, and we moved there in 2000 uh, from Guam. Uh, we lived in Guam since I was born till year 2000. My, my dad was in the Navy. Um, so, you know, grew up in Florida, went to college for my bachelor's and master's in Florida. I definitely enjoy the sunshine, don't enjoy the snow, but here we are in Virginia getting a nice balance. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I, I really enjoy being at Mason um, for what, I, what I've been able to accomplish in my career. And I, I like the DMV area. I, I like living here, offering, um, enjoying what it has to offer. Obviously COVID has put a rail on everything, but still being grateful for what I have and what I can do for people. So again, Phil, thanks for having me on the show. Well, I love it. And like, you know what, I'm just going to go on a pivot because I, we had some topics we we're going to talk about, but you know, now that I uh, thought about it, I'm, I really want to focus on the higher ed experience and maybe just like how we get into this. Cause you know, honestly, I think that uh, the journey of a lot of professionals in the higher ed is the most random stories. I don't think anyone grows up and says, you know what? I want to be bubbly and I want to be an orientation leader. And then, and then from that orientation leader stuff, um, I want to, you know, be a, a director or whatever. It's, it's the most, I think higher ed is probably one of the most random professions around. So just kind of going back, you grew up military brat, similar to me. What made, you know, when you decided to go to college, why did you decide to stay in Florida? And, and I know that about you, but why did you decide to stay in Florida for college? Yeah. Um, so my oldest, I, two, I have two brothers. I'm the youngest of three. Um, my oldest brother, you know, we would consider him first generation after learning about mm-hmm. what that definition means. Mm-hmm. My mom went to school and my dad, you know, went to college, but they did it in the Philippines. They didn't study in America mm-hmm. in a traditional American higher education system. So, you know, by definition, the first generation of our family to go to college in the United States was my oldest brother. So I remember his process going, my mom and dad had to attend orientation. They had to learn what financial aid was. They had to learn about FAFSA. They had to learn about all these things 
you know, so they came home, they had all these notes and they were there all day. So being in that position now as an, uh, as, as an administrator, I kind of relate that back to my uh, experience, um, you know, as a student, because, you know, part of working um, is, you know, you, you, you're attracted to a career based on your life experiences. That's what mm-hmm. I always kind of believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, going into that later, uh, but going back to the original question, why I went to college in Florida, it was, it was new for us. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not that far separated from my brothers age-wise. And, you know, growing up in the city we grew up in, there was a local school and it was pretty good, very affordable. Both of my brothers went there and graduated. So it just seemed like it made sense for me to go there. Though it was between the, my undergrad, the University of West Florida versus mm-hmm. the University of Florida. So a lot of my high school friends got into UF. Yeah. Uh, I got in, you know, that being a sort of, comp- you know, competitive school, arguably the flagship state U- institution of Florida. I got in, I was really excited, but my parents, you know, they were like, that's too expensive. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And so that's really like, uh, I didn't go look out of state. I mean, I thought of it, but, you know, I, I've heard of kids from high school going to Harvard or Georgia Tech or, University of Alabama, but I'm like, no, like that's not really my family just because we couldn't really afford to do that. And it wasn't something I thought of. College was always on the horizon for me. Mm-hmm. Um, with I can never remember my parents directly telling me to go, but I always knew I needed, I wanted to, mm-hmm. I guess because my brothers um, and seeing them like enjoy it, like it was really cool. Um, and it was pretty welcoming going to, to my local college. I ended up going to West Florida and when I was a freshman going to orientation, my, my older brother was an orientation leader. So, okay. yeah. so that kind of also helped me figure out what orientation and this career was. Because right when I walked in to check in, my brother just handed me my room key for the overnight <laughs> stay. And he's like, go to this room. I didn't wait in line. And then all of his orientation oh, leader yeah. friends, all of his orientation leader friends came up to me like, oh, you're Mark's brother. Hello. So I just felt so welcome. Yeah. And I was like, okay, like, this is going to be fine. And I had my two older brothers who knew a lot about the university. So yeah, I mean, that was like a a lot of the reasons why I went to school in in home, like my hometown in Florida, because it just made sense. Yeah. You know, obviously still fortunate that all me and my two brothers, all three of us are all college graduates. My mom's always proud of that fact. Yeah. You know, two, two of us have master's degrees, so we, ha- we definitely had a lot of privilege and position being able to study in higher ed. Um, but yeah, it just, it just made sense. Like everything was just kind of worked out and I wouldn't trade it. I mean, I always, I always joke that I, if I went to UF, I may would, I, I, I may have flunked out and had to move back home anyway. So yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't take that year and, and just stayed um, at home, but I, I, I don't trade it for anything. I, I think it would, it, it provided me a lot of good opportunities. So, wow. So like just hearing that your brother was already the plug and like, it was like already set the tone. So uh, yeah. going off a tangent, then if you knew your other, your older brothers was there, how did you like touch down in college and say, okay, you know, while everyone's like, yo, I'm Mark's little brother, I'm going to make my own name or my own identity at this university. Yeah. Uh, I think it was easier for me to do that at the university level because it was bigger Mm-hmm. Uh, I was shadowed by them all through middle school and high school. Uh, we had all the same teachers because we were all honors and AP. Uh, so every time I went to one of their teachers, they were like, oh, another DeLuna or the final <laughs> DeLuna. <laughs> right? like, they, had, they had a lot of expectations. And I always took that as kind of like, you know, why can't they see me for me? But in a way, it kind of helped me be more successful Yeah, because they knew that they could push me to do what I accomplished. And also they expected a lot of things from me and I wanted to match that, you know, it was always kind of a playing catch up almost for my brothers in high school and in middle school. Um, funny, fun fact, Escambia High School in Pensacola, Florida, me and both of my brothers, all three of us are in the high school hall of fame. So shout, shout out to Escambia High yeah, School. Yeah, look at you, hall of fame. <laughs> yeah, we, we're all, we all have like pictures and these like picture frames in the administrative <laughs> hallway. <laughs> And if you, if you go back and they still have them hung up, you can see us like 2005, 2006, 2008. So I don't know, that's kind of a cool legacy. Uh, but yeah, like we were all involved in different things in college. I think that was a cool thing. My oldest brother, you know, he never lived on campus, but he had his own 
involvement. Uh, he studied education. So he was involved in the writing center. That was his big kind of piece of involvement. And my second oldest brother was heavily involved in the honors program. Um, and he, he studied clinical lab sciences. So he was really involved with that. Uh, and I, and then as I got involved, I got involved in the higher ed thing with orientation and, and um, being an RA, I was a music major. So we all had really different paths, which was cool. Um, so I never really had to worry about, you know, what, what impact or legacy am I going to leave? Mm -hmm. Because college was so wide open that I was able to kind of craft my own path. I didn't have to, that was a time when I no longer had to follow what they did. Right. Cause in a way in, in middle school and high school, seeing how they were successful and like, okay, I need to get involved. I need to get A's, whatever. But in college, it was like, what do I want to do? Uh, what, what path do I want to carve for myself? So it was kind of cool that the three of us split off into our own different things and are all successful in our own, own ways now being so long um, later after we all graduated college. So it wasn't hard for me. I just felt advantaged because, you know, they knew what to do. You know, my parents didn't intend my orientation. They didn't. They're like, yeah, we know what to do. Just go. We'll pick, we'll, we'll pick you up when we're, you, when you're done. Like Mark's there, like my, my older brother. So he like showed me the ropes. And again, like I felt like I was in the plug because he just yeah. got me acclimated. Um, so yeah, I, I, as I continue to reflect, you know, paralleling the work I do with students now, I was very, you know, privileged and in a really great position to be successful. So a part of why I'm so passionate about making sure students that don't have those, Please. don't have access to those yeah. things are successful because I was so successful and fortunate. Well, you know, I think you left out a big thing about a student involvement that you were, you know, a group that you were involved <laughs> in. So, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, what do they call us? Fratters or, you know, like we're, we're considered fratters. 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 I don't frat know what that boys. You no, know, you know, wasn't it like frat, the, No, like fra, 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 frater is brother in Latin. Yeah, but yeah, doesn't it, it like, from, don't you say, yeah, don't you say that like, you know, like if you're not in the same frat, but you're both frat members, you say that like we're fratters or something. I don't know. But the point uh, is, I'm jumping to like, you, you, got, <laughs> you got involved. How did that happen, man? How did you get involved uh, with, with the organization yeah. that you got involved with? Yeah, so 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 I'm a brother of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Shout out to the Blue, whoever's <laughs> listening. Um, but yeah, I got involved. it was funny, funnily enough through orientation experience. Okay, look um, at that. Wow. One of one of the orientation leaders. Uh, shout out to Jonathan Williams, one of my pro fights. Uh, if he ever listens to this, big shout out to him. He was an orientation leader with me, and it started small. It started small. He's like, "Hey Joe, have you ever heard of fraternity and sorority life?" I'm like, no, not really. Because my freshman year, my, my roommate at the time pledged an IFC organization. And I was not really into those. Like, again, nothing against IFC, but I didn't really see myself fitting it. Uh, so, you know, my, my sophomore year, I'm an OL. And, you know, he asks me, like, have you ever heard of fraternity story? I'm like, no, not really not into it. He's like, okay. Next time we, he brings up, Joe, have you ever heard of the Divine Nine? I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like okay, no idea. So, so just no. Really, just it was, it, it was just a progression, because <laughs> you know he, because yeah, like you know he 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 would he was really involved in the org. Um, I knew a lot of the brothers from my brother who knew a lot of them and just mutual people. Um, I would see them on campus all the time because at that time the D nine was not really represented at our university for whatever reason. It was really small. Okay. Um, and then eventually he's like Joe. I want, I want to talk to you about five basic. I was like, okay. So, you know, as a lot of interests would, they, you know, I, I went to, you know, I Googled divine nine. I saw the fraternities. I went to each fraternity's website and, you know, Sigma, albeit it was the only one, you know, kind of open, um, active on our campus really spoke to me and in, in their, you know, their mottos and, you know, how they laid out their website, like those cosmetics, um, you know, like being an organization that wanted to, de to define the exclusive and be inclusive. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it provided a space for people to be who they were and a big part of it too. And I think, you know, not being a legacy, not being an HBCU, not being in a, at a school that had a very big fraternity and sorority life. 
I really clicked with a lot of the brothers. Um, I remember my first interest meeting. I still remember it. I, you know, they were like, wear a tie, look presentable. I was like, all right. So I somehow found a tie and this blazer <laughs> that didn't really fit. It. But I wanted a whole business suit. Because at that time, I actually didn't own a suit. Um, but I, I still vividly remember I walked in and all the brothers were just sitting there in suits, just real stoic and serious. So I felt very intimidated because it was an interest meeting. It wasn't it wasn't a full on, you know, any, it was just a very formal interest. Meeting. I sit down and then eventually they turn on the TV and start watching football and I'll start laughing and, and having a good time. And I'm sitting there like, this is weird. <laughs> this is not what I expected. And also, you know, to to address the elephant in the room, me not being black yeah. was very intimidating. Um, but there was a brother of the chapter, shout out to Dali Ramos, one of my pro fights. Uh, he, he is Latinx and he, you know, active in the chapter too. So, and, you know, he was my brother's friend. He was an OL and orientation leader when I was a freshman. So wow. I already had an idea of who he was. So it all kind of worked together. Um, yeah, I mean, after that meeting, like, they just seemed like really great people. Obviously, I kind of knew some of them. Yeah. They knew who I was. Um, and then with Jonathan's kind of, you know, guidance, I got more interested. And eventually, I, I became a brother fall 12. Um, lots of lines after me. It's awesome seeing the org really, really grow and continue to do great things. My chapter, especially shout out to Beta Beta Phi, the groundbreaking Beta Beta Phi chapter. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was told that identity, race was not a factor. Yeah. And that's one thing that I've always kind of seen with, you know, Sigma in my, you know, attending a, a national FSL conference and meeting a lot of brothers in higher ed. There's a lot of opportunity to really be who you are, because I, always, I, I was always told that the fraternity brings out what's already in you. And, you know, that's something I really believe. And I'm sure a lot of other organizations say that, you know, you, like your brothers, Phil, they enhance what you already have inside. And that's what I really like. They didn't want to create some, they didn't want to make me something. I mean, they made me Sigma man, yeah. but they weren't going to yeah. make something that wasn't already there. You're Joe the Sigma, not the Sigma that's Joe. That's always, yeah. that's, that's, that's yeah. always my thing. But that, that core, which is so interesting, and, and you know, going back, you know, I was said, now I'm thinking about it more about your journey in higher ed is that, wow, orientation was so impactful for you. Like, I didn't realize, <laughs> like, like, everything that you touched upon, every topic, and that's what I'm, and now maybe that's what I what kind of would focus on this podcast was that, like, how instrumental it is for anyone as they touch down at a college. That like literally that could be the spark, right? That you no, know, that the 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 bubbly welcoming person or the plug that you have, your family, or like you you literally named like 10 people that were like orientation leaders with you. Like how from my understanding is just showing like how important involvement was. Like involvement not only touching down, but the first day in college. And usually I think a lot of students, and, and this is where I'm kind of going, maybe going a tangent, and what I understand is like a lot of people sometimes fall through the cracks. They like, oh yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of people talking as an orientation, but not realize like, you know, I can go back and say, yo, I remember who I sat next to and that was like my roommate and that became my best friend. How impactful that that orientation experience is. And I don't know, just from what you're saying, it was super impactful. Like just in general, all the people you met touching down um, at your college. So does that kind of, and, and so the question is, did, do you think that knowing how impactful orientation was for you, that kind of drives like this is really important job like this, like this is not just, you know, rah, 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 like we're really setting these kids up for a, a, a really driving experience in college. Yeah, I mean, even now when I am I'm kind of reflecting on everyone who influenced me in college, yeah, like a lot of it did point back to my orientation experience. Um, and but I really, I really think, you know, and, and this is kind of what I reinforced with my OLs at, at Mason with, with colleagues I talk to, you are really that first impression. And that first impression makes or breaks a lot of experiences, mm -hmm. you know, fairly or unfairly. And I think a lot of, again, my 
experience in at the university drives how I work for people in my career right now. Mm-hmm. The the fact that people made an impact on me from from the moment I walked in, that's mm-hmm. the kind of thing I want to train my students to do. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the attitude I want to have. I can never assume students have the resources or they may have them. So mm-hmm. I have to kind of work with students as they are. Um, you know, kind of, you know, working into a lot of the work that people have been activated to do now involving, you know, anti-racism and Mm -hmm. working with minoritized and marginalized communities, you know, the research shows and a lot of, Mm -hmm. you know, people who've done action research with those populations is you have to work with what they identify they need. Mm, You are not there to be the hero or deem to them, this is what you need. And this is how I'm going to give to you. Mm. You have to really listen to them and take their word on what they need. You know, it's, it's like, it's like the crux of when, you know, people go into a a, a community and say like, Hey, we want to help you. This is what we're going to do without even doing research or asking Mm. or reflecting Mm. on what they need. Also, not everyone needs fixing. You know, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a big pitfall, too, of what people do when they want to fix a community or help a student. Mm-hmm. They, they assume something's wrong. And that now may be the case. You know, a lot of students who don't have anything are very strong, very capable people. And that was a bias that I had for a long time of, oh, a student's first gen, a student doesn't have their family with them, a student is paying for college, they, they must be broken or they must need help, I must have to do anything to fix them. No, that, that's an unfair assumption to that person. But if you go into it, being at their level, telling them that you're there to support them, then if they, if they need you, they'll reach out to you. Because at the end of all that, why are you helping people to feel good, to be a savior? If you're doing it for those reasons, then you're not really doing it for the right reason. Yeah. So a lot of you know orientation and how I work in my career, you know how I teach my students, train them is a reflection of the things that I've experienced as reflect on from my life, which again, I recognize that I had a lot of privilege going to school. You know, I didn't have to take out loans until grad school, but that was my choice. Mm-hmm. My parents always helped me when they needed, when I needed, my brothers were there to help me. Like I, I just told you, like I had mm-hmm. infinite friends that were seasoned, you know, students of the university yep. right when I started. Mm-hmm. And a lot mm-hmm. of students can't say that. So I have to always reflect on those things, it, you know, from, from my experiences and transform them into something that I can apply to others when I help them. So how do we pivot? I mean, obviously, you know, uh, this is another one, like, I feel like COVID and we're in COVID. How does that present that experience? Like, how, how do we work around that? How do we make someone feel welcome at a community? when they might not even touch down <laughs> you know what I'm saying like yeah like welcome to this community uh on your laptop you feel me like yeah like, like, how do you, at, how do you, at, at, at your at your place of residence right? yeah like you know like all right like how do, I, yeah. how, how are we doing this joe how, how we how do we how do we get there how do we do that yeah so there are so many <laughs> there are so many layers to this um oh. and that and that's one thing i've really learned too uh because you know we 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 work to help the student and provide the student a meaningful experience. And students mm-hmm. are very clear that this is not the experience they may want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we have, we, have to, we have to own that first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. Because a, a lot of what, you know, negatively or positively, take it as you may, a lot of people in student affairs work because it makes them feel good. They're passionate about it. Yes. X, Y, Z, like, I don't do this for money, all that nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> You know, not, again, not calling out hey, our higher. We're not doing it for or, money, but put put the, put your, put your name in the cash app. Put it yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not not doing it. Not not calling out the higher <laughs> folks who are listening. But uh, why we do this work is again, it's like what I said. We're it's a reflection of our experiences, and if we yeah, had a good experience, sure. we want to give that back. Mm-hmm. So first, it's recognizing that. And um, I was about to say real quick: if we had a good experience, we want to give that back. Or I've also noticed this, if we had a bad experience, we go into this work to like make sure that no one else has that same one. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and a lot of students now that we work with kind of have that same mentality. But 
But yeah, like creating an experience for students, you have to first settle with what you can do. Mm -hmm. No matter what you have intention of, if all the state mandates, your new university mandates, the mm -hmm. world have to force yourself into a virtual platform, step mm -hmm. one, you have to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and, and that's a harsh reality for a lot of people in this field because one thing COVID has done has exposed a lot of inequality that already exists. It's mm -hmm. exposed a lot of value of roles. And again, I'm treading this lightly because I'm not here to undermine or devalue anyone's position, but that's the world we live in because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. ultimately the university is still a business mm -hmm. and we don't live in a society where universities aren't treated as such. There are a mm -hmm. lot of people to appease, there are bills to pay. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of students can't see that side of it. They only mm -hmm. see what's impacting them, which Again, that's something that we have to, mm -hmm. you know, face head on. So, yeah. you know, as we in our office had to pivot and we had to do it quickly, you know, if, if, this, if the state and the university tells us you can't have in-person programs, what are we going to do? Be like, hmm, how can we make our in-person experience virtual? If, if, if that's what you're trying to do, then it may not be as successful or meaningful as okay, we can't have in-person programs. What is our goal of our program? Yeah. What are we trying to achieve with our program? Yeah. Okay, we have our goal and our, our objectives. Now let's translate those goals and objectives into a virtual plan. Yeah. It's like saying, yeah. hey, yeah. you know, every year we, we have a you know, virtual concert. So we're just going to, or every year we have an in-person concert. So we're just going to put it on Zoom and students are still going to enjoy it. They can go on YouTube and watch a virtual concert. They don't yeah. need to come yeah, for virtual yeah. concerts we throw. So you have to yeah. take what you want or what mm -hmm. you were trying to achieve with your event or your program. And then you have to transfer it into the modality that you must follow. Yeah. You can't just replicate something that was in person virtually. I think a lot no. of people have discovered that that doesn't work. Yeah. It's not as fun and as boring. And it's not as fun. Yeah. It's not as engaging. A lot of activities that we do for orientation don't work virtually. So we had to completely shift the things we're doing. Yeah. You know, with virtual, you know, silver lining of virtual, it adds a lot more access in ways. You yep. know, people don't have to spend money on plane tickets or traveling, yes. hotel. Yeah. But, you know, it, it still creates a lot of problems of how many computers or devices are there in a household or students and families in household where they could devote six hours to orientation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What responsibilities does a student have outside of orientation, right? These are all things that we have started to address and, you know, we do our best to, to work around those things, but ultimately it's so hard to, uh, you know, find a solution for everybody for the same program. Right. That's like saying we want an orientation for every population that is represented at the university. And that's just, that's just not feasible as much as we want to do a Spanish speaking, a, a uh -huh. Arabic speaking, a orientation for veterans, an orientation for parenting students. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of give and take there, but if you can streamline what you do in your program to try to hit a lot of those populations to try to provide an inclusive all around experience, but you have to be okay with, you may disappoint people. Yeah. That's the hard one. Yeah. And, and, and that's hard because again, like I said earlier, we're very passionate about this work and we don't want to disappoint anyone, but it's going to happen. <laughs> so, so how, how do we create systems to make change if possible, i.e. assessment, whoever's oh. listening to this, please, Oh, rewrite your assessment please yeah, yeah. use your data please start collecting longitudinal data to reflect on what your programs are achieving please whoever's oh, listening man. please numbers man i don't know yeah, yeah <laughs> i can't i know i i do definitely as i've gotten older and more mature i realized the business part is assessment and data and proven worth and all those things and learning outcomes and all those things right like and i think you I, I, honestly joe i think you nailed it on the head too it's like all right, what is the actual goal? Like the real learning objective or goal or the point of this? And then let's work reverse engineer and find a way to get to that goal. That doesn't just mean like copy and paste Zoom. You know, like, like you know, like we- Yeah, we, that we doesn't really work. Goal, you know, it doesn't work. Um, and, 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 you, and you could transfer, you could transfer that same, same mindset across all the different university 
uh, student affairs experiences, career mm -hmm. orientation, yeah. housing, all those things. It's like, we all have goals, but uh, we definitely, I like what you said is that we have restrictions now and we still have to meet those goals, but we can't just be lazy about hitting those goals. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, oh, we got Zoom. That's the easy way. You know, like, and I like that. I, I never thought about that. I, I wrote that down too. It's like, what do we really want uh, people to learn or gain or experience experience yeah but not the easy way i guess you know and, and, and that could be difficult because honestly I, I i ain't gonna lie i think i someone was like yo are you from working from home is it easier and i feel like we've done way more planning i've done way more planning and and <laughs> and, and, and brainstorming and all that this summer you know that summer going into this the fall uh -huh. when we were like this is going to be a completely virtual-ish semester yeah. than i ever have in, in in all of my years of higher ed like yeah. this was the busiest summer that i ever had you know most summers like yo we chilling we off well i know you're not off you you're busy <laughs> we, we, summer. yeah we're never off we're no never we're never off, off but <laughs> we're like, never off. I, I was saying i was like man this is the busiest i ever been so I yeah no that i mean experience too i mean that makes sense like you have to you know, strip down everything you've done before. You can't be complacent because mm -hmm. everyone's cycle is different now. Yeah. You know, yeah. working from home for the foreseeable future. And even if we do go back, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. Everything's going to be different, like protocol and, and people in the room, people's yeah. comfortability. You can't just chum it up with people and be like, hey, we're all the same. It's all right. It's all right now. That's not true. Yeah, because that, that's that's what's going to get us back into this position. if we just treat like everything's OK and, you know, all this stuff about the new normal and when things get back to normal, like I'm always so 50 50 when people say that stuff. I'm like, there's yeah. like things have to change moving forward because we've, you know, fortunately, we've learned a lot in our office about our programming and, and how to be successful through COVID, you know, the silver lining. We've taken mm -hmm. away a lot of different things that we want to do that we may do. Uh as a result of COVID just because it, it just seems to make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I feel you. I, I feel like a lot of people had to, you know, I, people were kept honest. They couldn't just rely on what they've done already. They had to rethink everything mm -hmm. from, from, from the ground up from like, all right, what's our goal? Like, you know, you yeah. all's big production, the career fair, right? Like, yeah, you, you, all, you all, you all, you all had probably like a year long timeline and, you, you all have to in career service has to really rethink that, but you know, mm -hmm. it's a testament to the way we could be flexible and then change and adapt to change. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, all right, you have to do orientation virtually. We had to throw every plan we used to do out the window and just kind of reset everything. And luckily we, we felt successful and you know, this summer we only can, you know, grow from where we were before. So, so like, you know, like at the essence of, I, I will say, you know, the very core of, and, and like, first of all, this is full of orchestration. I am not speaking on behalf of career services, <laughs> uh, joking. But I think at the core of us is equity, uh, you know, the, the career readiness and uh, making sure, you know, at regardless of the programs and services, I think we, we have a lazy, you know, a really strong focus, or I have a strong focus on uh, that, you know, a student as they come in the door and they leave Mason, they feel accomplished and ready for uh, career transitions and growth, right? Like, like we don't, we're not gonna give them a magic ticket and um, they get like a job, but they get the skills to interview and market themselves and research jobs, right? At the core. Um, and so, you know, I, I hold on to that in my mind. Like, as long as I feel like students, you know, regardless of these cycles will feel ready, career ready, uh, that's what we hold on to. What is one of the things you hold on to? Like, yeah, like if I can hammer this message into students that come, uh, uh, that come to orientation or whatever, like my message, if I'm gonna hammer it down is that you need to just be ready to do this over again, you know, resumes, cover letters, present yourself. Like if I could just, that's it. If I could really get to you, what would be your thing? Like, yo, this is core of, of the experience of welcoming you to, to any community, Mason or insert college. What is something that you really want a student to know when they attend anything virtually or in person in regards to orientation? That's tough. I mean, there's a lot that we want them to take away. Yeah. 
Um, obviously, you talked about career readiness, and everyone talks about getting involved. I think for me personally, I think mm -hmm. students, if there's one thing I can just tell every student who comes into our community to, with the intent to graduate, get a job, whatever, I think I would want to tell them to build good habits now. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I tell my OLs that I tell you know, any, any person I work with build good habits now. Cause that kind of stems into everything else. Mm -hmm. Build good habits about communicating with people, whether that's email phone call, text, Zoom, if that's to your friend, your professor, you know, whoever, communicate to build those good habits. Because uh, mm -hmm. a student should see the college experience as a scaffold. Every year is building off of itself. Mm -hmm. What you learn your first year, you're not just going to be like, all right, I'm done with this, move on to year two, year three, year four. Everything that you learn from the first year to when you leave, you should build on itself and you should continue to grow those skills yeah. you know students will sometimes say this year i really want to get better with public speaking and then next year i really want to get an internship the next year i want to do a master's <laughs> next year i want to apply to life apply to law school all of those things build on each other yeah. and if you don't start hitting deadlines from day one if you don't start learning how to communicate with people whoever it may be effectively on day one if you don't start advocating for what you believe in, what you want, then it's going to be hard because those mm -hmm. things all play into the job world. You know, they, I, I'm very big on self-advocacy now because I remember in my first job out of grad school, I was a residence director in upstate New York. And, you know, our, our director was like, hey, everyone, we're, we're, I'm sending a Google Doc so we can all sign up for committees or projects. Please provide your preferences. I'm like, ah, I guess I'll be okay with all of them. So I put like, sure, like, yes, I, I put like maybe, but not yes or no on like most of them. And I ended up getting a lot of ones I didn't want. And I was like, oh, this stinks. And then I said to myself like, oh, well, maybe if I said no, I wouldn't have got the ones I didn't want. Because I always thought saying no was bad. Yeah. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> saying no is one of the best things you can do to find balance, to advocate for yourself, to get out, get, get out of weird situations. Um, so again, to, to, mm -hmm. to sum it up, having a student get in their mind of building good habits early, I think would really benefit them through their entire experience into the workforce, into grad school, into the Peace Corps, into whatever they want to do, because they've, they, they've created that foundation. They have those building blocks. So yeah. If, if, I'm, if I was able to tell a big message to every group of orient students who come through orientation, I would tell them to build good habits now. Start now. Planner, Google Calendar, reminders on your phone, whatever it may be, meal prep, whatever habits you need to do to make yeah. yourself successful, do it. Hey, that's, hey, that's Joe and that's his TED Talk right there. <laughs> no, that's it, man. Hey, you about to make it, man. Hey, you about to have like a, a PowerPoint now. And that's going to be like, it's going to be, gonna be like build good habits and it's just going to go through every pocket oh, of higher man. ed where that's that can be saying. applicable, man. Look, look, yo, I see it now. That's super, I mean, and I, I think that was really impactful. I think that, um, like, it's like, I think we're, we're, we're there. I, I mean, I'm older than you. I, I feel like I'm there at the middle age. I feel like I'm in that age where I'm like, you know, I'm old enough. And I was like, man, like all these lessons, all these nuggets, man, I wish I could have told myself the build habit one. I wish I could have told myself to go to career services. <laughs> and then look at me, I'm working here now. Like, and I was like, wow, I think that, I think uh, additionally, I think that's a lot of the journey of a lot of higher ed professionals. I met a few weirdos and I'll call them weirdos that say, when I was a freshman, I knew I was going to work in college. I was like, are, are you, who? Who are who, you? Who are you? <laughs> who are you? No like, one else what? does. But I, I think it builds upon that one, the, the more scaffolding situation where your, your, your experiences build upon each other and you're like, wow, I had a good experience here or, good, or bad experience here. And then you wake up and you're 35 with two kids in a van and you work at a college. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, shout, shout out to the van life. Shout yeah, man, like, <laughs> but, but I, I think th those are just great nuggets. I think that that's something that, you know, if you're a young listener that's in college that listens randomly to my podcast, or you are someone that works in higher ed, I think these are some messages that you should share. Uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's just so interesting to me that a lot of the people that I work with are great people like you and and I'll say there's no but and that it's like we have all these life lessons as we <laughs> now <laughs> at this moment where I don't think we all had those when we were in college I don't know that's just fun. I find that so fascinating for a lot of people that I speak about this experiences that work in higher ed is that like wow like we we, we have all this intellectual knowledge uh but it's it's really built upon our experiences you know yeah yeah, and, and that, that goes back to what I said earlier, what we do for work or what we really are passionate about is is based on our life experience. Like what we've experienced drives us to do some things subconsciously, I think. You know, I it's been a long time since I've reflected on all these pieces, like before this conversation. And when I really think about it, the why I'm doing my work is based on what I needed as a student, mm-hmm. what I experienced as a student, yeah. what people gave me. You know, my, my first mentor, shout out to Caitlin Cicchetti, director of advancement at, you know, university life at George Mason university. You know, I will always consider her my first mentor. And, you know, years later we end up working together and that's just a testament to, that's a testament to what she mentored me into, but also what she showed me that, you know, I had in me. Hold up. Wait up. Y'all, y'all, y'all overlap before this. Yeah. So (laughs) So funny story about how I got to Mason, uh, you know, as we do a tangent with with George Mason University. So when I was at orientation leader in 2010, Caitlin was my direct supervisor at UWF at University of West Florida. So I remember she told me, you know, she she told me that she was leaving the university and get she got a job at George Mason University. Um. And I was really sad because, you know, we had built a really good connection. She gave me hard advice. She was supportive. She was my first, you know, boss in a job at the university. Um, We stayed in touch for a little bit and then we kind of got out of touch. And then I saw the job posting at Mason back in like 2016. I'm like, I wonder if Caitlin is still, I wonder if she's still at Mason. So I found out she was, I saw her in email. I was like, hey, I would love to catch up. So we started catching up and then she's eventually like, Joe, do you want to know about the job that we have posted? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Cause at the time I contacted her, I was in housing and I wanted a career switch. Um, and you know, months later I find myself moving here working at Mason. Um, yeah, she, it, it's a testament again to how small this field is. We always say this field is small. Yeah. That the fact that we became colleagues was something in a million years I never thought would happen. Yeah. If if you, if you told 18 year old Joe in 2010, 19 year old Joe in 2010, that, Hey, you and Caitlin are going to be working in the same office when you finish graduate school. I'd be like, no way. Yeah. She's way older than, my, than, than me at that, at that time, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but she yeah, grown. It, she was growing your kid. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I was, you know, I was trying to find my way and, and yeah, yeah. she was, she, she was growing up. So, so yeah, it was, it was really cool that, Again, a lot of that scaffolding happened and yeah. I can reflect on it. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm going to use that in scaffolding and then obviously building relationships. I'll be honest too, like I got my job at Career Services because of someone connecting with me and staying in touch. Like I applied about umpteen, like 30 jobs before I got my job back here, I, you know? So it's it's always built upon relationships. Um, so I always tell people that's very important, especially in this field too, as small as it is. But I, dang, I just think it's crazy. Like I really, yeah, I definitely in 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 going where we're going with this with this conversation. I think that's one of the things too that we can add to that is build good habits. Now, add another one: build good relationships. <laughs> like you know, yes, hey, throw that throw that in there. We, we about to, hey Joe, we about to go on the road. <laughs> and we about to uh, we about to do. Uh, uh, we're gonna we, go on tour. What, Pete, what, you, what you should Phil do in higher ed? Phil and Jay. <laughs> yes. What you should do in higher ed: build good relationships and build good habits. And then yes. and just sell it, you know, say uh, we'll be rich. Um, uh, so, Joe, I think that's the part of the show. You know, we really had a great conversation. It's called Shot for Shot, where you get to ask me any random question. I get to ask you any random question, not even related to this topic at all. Do you want to go first? Okay. Or I'll go first. I will go first. All right. Go ahead. This is the literally the first thing I thought of. Does your right big toe hurt right now? My right toe? Your right big toe, does it hurt right now? No, why? 
It was a random question. Oh, it was like, come on, man, no. <laughs> this, I, was it, like, what? I was like, what? No. Is that like, I was about to say, is that like a, a saying for like, no, no. that the Buccaneers <laughs> is getting punished or something? Like, no, no, like, no, 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 I was no, like, no, oh no, my no. goodness. No, because my my left big toe is so <laughs> now. So I, I, that was the first thing that came on my mind. Give me another one, Joe. Come on, man. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right. <laughs> All right, all right. Redo, redo, redo. <laughs> yeah. I'm leaving um, that in there, but I was like, wait, I was like, I was like, is this a, a superstition? Because I know I, <laughs> I know I was going against the Chiefs, and I didn't know if that meant like, yo, you're big. Okay, one. okay, okay. Here, okay, random question. I got one. Okay, go ahead. It, if you could live on any other planet besides Earth, totally sustain yourself, whatever, which which planet? Uh, it's not a planet, it'd just be the moon. And the reason why is I don't know. I still like looking at the earth. I don't want to be too far. <laughs> so, like, like, I mean, you so, could technically look at the earth if you had a telescope. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I, I was going to say either the moon or Mars, because the only reason why I know Mars is because I watched Total Recall and they did it, <laughs> and they did it on Total Wait, Recall. Wait, the old or the new one? Both. Really I important. watched both. Well, the, oh, you like them. Well, the, oh. new one, the new one wasn't at Mars, was it? No, it, I think... I think it was the Maybe old was the, the old one was definitely the old one, Mars. The old one was great. It's the it's one, one of my it's one of my Netflix go tos in the background. Oh, it is because, okay because I've seen it so much, so I can kind of predict what happens. But it's still like Arnold is just so good in it. It's just and yeah. Michael Ironside, like uh, yeah, I, I love that movie. I mean, I it's pretty it. good. You know, I love all movies. I, I, you know, no, me and Joe, we got to do another Netflix. I just be watching bad movies and old movies. Like, <laughs> Yo, <laughs> that time up. when we watched T- Ninja, Ninja Turtles, Turtles two and everyone would be clowning in it. <laughs> that was like, I was like, this movie makes no sense. It is so funny. Yeah. So yeah, it'd be Mars. Mars. Okay. O- okay. Only because I saw it, it, you know, like because I had the image of the movie and I saw that they did it and they had like the little the dome and whatever. yeah, yeah I was yeah, like, yeah. okay, that makes sense. I can live on Mars. Okay. And maybe yeah. it might happen. Yeah. All right. Maybe. I got one and I, it's not really that random. I know you, but it's gonna be random for our listeners. You don't know this, but Joe is the bachata salsa <laughs> uh dancing king. Like First of all, oh I was so I, I went to his birthday party. I went to his virtual birthday party, and I was just like, "Okay, I'm gonna meet you know some of I'm gonna get to know Joe's friends and Joe's uh, Joe's side life, his 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 separate life." And I thought it was gonna be some <laughs> hired people. I thought it was gonna be a bunch of uh, sigmas. No, in this in this birthday celebration, it was all it was mad Joe's dancing friends. <laughs> And I was like, yo, first of all, there's probably never been an opportunity for you to dance. Like what, like orientation or whatever, like, I mean, or a, a, a staff holiday party or whatever. I don't know. So I was just so amazed. I was like, man, this dude is the dancing king. Everyone was talking about Joe, Joe got, the, uh, got the moves. So Joe, this is the uh, question. Now that I know that, how did you get into bachata and all that mm, dancing? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so was, I, I got into it in college. Um, I, I mean, I've I've been familiar with like Afro-Cuban, Latin music for a long time. I played I played the trombone for a long time, so I was in the jazz band. You know, all like the great you know Latin, Afro-Cuban musicians, Chick Corea, Arturo Sandoval. Um, you know, all, all all those people who played good music, and so I was familiar with the music. But one of my good friends, he was like, hey, Joe, have you ever danced salsa? I'm like, no. <laughs> He's like, well, our club is doing a, 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 they're doing a class tonight that teaches all the basics you should go. And I was like, yeah, why not? So I went, it was like 6 p.m. They're like, all right, everyone, we're going to learn the salsa basics then. All right, we're going to do bachata. All right, we're going to do merengue. So I learned all of that. Um, I went to another class and I learned like a salsa combo with a friend of mine, like a, a series of moves. And that, that same night, there was like a social happening in downtown. So I was like, hey, let's go. Let's just put ourselves out there. So we went to this club. There was music. There were a bunch of really great dancers. And I felt so bad because the whole night, I tried to do the combo with the friend who I went with, and I could not do it. So she didn't dance with anyone else, I don't think. I don't think I danced with anyone else. But I just kept trying to do the combo. And I didn't. I couldn't figure it out. So I kept going. And eventually, I got it. And I was like, wow, this is fun. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I love to dance. I love music. Obviously, like the, this dance community here in Florida, uh, up in New York when I lived there, 
introduced me to a lot of really great people. So it was really the social aspect for me that really kept me going. Um, yeah. you know, I've been dancing for 11 years now, 12, 10, 10, 11 years. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really big part of, of, of my life, a part of my identity. Um, and I actually did a presentation at, at NODA, the NODA annual conference in 2019, or is it 2018? Some, some NODA conference, I did a presentation relating your passions to your work. So, you know, when, when I think of salsa dancing or bachata or whatever, you have to be detail oriented. You have to have discipline. You have to be a relationship builder. You have to take risks and all of those parallel to my work. I have to build relationships at work. I have to take risks sometimes. I have to be detail oriented. And, you know, I, I thought of like, it was a cool concept that my confidence in, in dance could translate to work and then vice versa. So, so that's kind of like, again, my, in my reflection and, and whatever, um, why dance is so important to me. And, you know, if, if, if your listeners ever want to see videos of me, you know, shout out to my Instagram. I don't like putting myself out there like that, but I do love dancing. So hopefully one day when, when things are a little more safe, that that could continue because I do miss it a lot. Um, and the dance scene in the DMV is actually ridiculous. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, I, no, I like, jumped on that call. You had like bad people. I was like, hey, what's up? All these people and all these dance. And you had, I mean, you had <laughs> I, obviously the, the world of Zoom brought it together. But you had people like you said, you had yeah. people from Florida, New York, and here are like. Yeah. Joe, Joe, I love dancing with you. I love dancing. I was like, dang, this this man with Joe's dancing. All right. Like, yeah, I, mean, I, I was yeah. so impressed. That was awesome. That was crazy. Yeah, I I miss it a lot. And I mean, I remember a friend of mine visited me two years ago, three years ago, and we went dancing eleven nights in a row. I'm not even lying. And this was me still going to work. We would get home at like three, four a.m. and I would go to work, and he would just be sleeping in, and then we would do it again the next night. Like eleven nights in a row, dance. Yeah, wow. Here in in, in DC, and like I also, the I also love that both of your stories were like, uh, Joe uh, is most like. Do you know about someone just randomly coming up to you like, do you know about the D nine? I don't know. Do you know? Do you know about the bachata? And you're like, uh, <laughs> and you just do it, man. That's crazy. That's that's what's up, man. Like both, of them, like just how the culture is. You're you're a cultural magnet, man. People just love to. Bring yeah. it to the communities, man. I think that's great. And you're just open to doing it. You're like, all right, I try that job. Yeah, absolutely. It, oh, it, man. It, it definitely has opened the doors to a lot of things for me. Well, well, I, I definitely think that was a great note to end on. So this is the part of the show I call it Shout Outs and Plugs. Uh, so the stage is set. This is all yours. I will not interrupt. You can shout out anyone you want to show love to, anyone. And then Plugs. Anywhere where you want the listeners who will listen to this to follow you or connect with you. And I'll put that in the show notes. So stage is set. Shout outs and plugs. Yeah. Um, I guess shout outs to, you know, my, my parents, uh, my brothers. Obviously, I reflect on them a lot earlier. Uh, and unending support and love for them. They give me. So shout out to the DeLunas, my, my family. Um, shout out to Caitlin at at, at you know, at Mason, shout out to to my experience that I've had at Mason. Mason is a very great place to be, and I've I've learned a lot. So just shout out to Mason. Shout out to my bros uh, of Beta Beta Phi. Um, shout out to Jonathan Williams. Shout out to my LBs, Savon, Darius, Jaron, Harry. Um, you know, I wouldn't be here without them, and you know, I hope one day that we can all be together again. So shout out to my LBs. Shout out to to Sigma, who's really given me a lot too, um, brought a lot of things out of me. Um, oh my God, there's so many people to shout out. Shout out to you, Phil. I remember, let me tell you all about the first time I met Phil. <laughs> let me tell you all how Phil gave me a certificate like a week after I met him. I'm like, who is this man just coming into my office? And I had things to do that day, but I didn't want to tell you that because we were just, we just met. But, um, but, but, big, but, you know, like in all, in all goofiness aside, big shout out to Phil. Like anytime people bring up Phil, it's always like a pleasure. He's always a bright spot for people. Phil's involved in a lot of things at Mason, involved with his fraternity. 
Um, so obviously like a leader of, of the positive Phil to this podcast. So Phil does a lot of great things, Phil. Sometimes I feel like you don't get the recognition you deserve. So I want to give you that here. And, you know, he's obviously a dad, great family, loving family, loving father. So big shout out to Phil Wilkerson, big fan. Oh, man. Uh, He'll put his cash app in the notes, so feel free to send him the tip. <laughs> send, send him nineteen dollars and six cents, please. Nineteen dollars and six cents. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie, I did that on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, though, I don't know. I just, I just have so many people to shout out. Like whoever's, whoever's listening to this, mm-hmm. um, shout out to you for wanting to open your ears to to some new content. To all the aspiring podcasters out there, shout mm-hmm. out to you all for for trying to get your hustle on the map, you know, get people listening to what you have to offer. So I big shout out to all those folks. All right. And then plugs where people can follow you. Oh uh, yeah. So you all can follow me on, on Twitter. Um, Joseph underscore Deluna. Um, my, t- my Twitter is set to private though. Um, yeah. You can follow me on Instagram, Joseph Deluna. I don't really post anything on there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> only, only stories, but I like to share content that I think people should, should, um, should be aware of and you can you can follow me on linkedin too you just search my name um but yeah i'm I'm really open to connect to people uh i i I really like connecting with people Um, i've always been somewhat of a social person life has grounded me but i think that's okay but i'm I'm still open to connecting with people especially you know if you're hire it or not hire it or not you know if if you're involved with with professional organizations or anything i'd love to connect but yeah, special plugs um, and, and, and shout outs. Really, Phil, want to thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for being on the podcast. And, you know, I definitely, we we touched on multiple subjects and I got to know you a little bit better. That's what I love doing about this podcast. And also, as I said earlier, you gave me a shout out, but I'll give you another one right back. As someone, you know, you are, you know, I am goofy, but I already knew that you were going to be a good friend and a special person that's why i gave you a certificate like the week after i met you i was like this, dude, I was this, like, this, this is this, the most random but hey, endearing, hey. most random but endearing but cool thing ever no nah, but i was like this this, this one man's and then you know just a good <laughs> sense of humor and, and i know particularly there's people that you know like you meet in different pockets and that you spoke to it very well earlier in the show was about that your experiences and passion overlap into the work you do right and mm-hmm. I know that fact, hundred percent about you is that the you you bring yourself to work, but also I mean obviously you, we're not workaholics, but we're saying like you bring yourself to work with the intention of making other people's experiences in the community uh, positive and upbeat and good, and you do that definitely. Um, I know you do that, so please connect with this good guy. Um, I'm going to forgive him for picking another organization other than the oldest and coldest, but you know, it's all good. It's all love. He's a fratter. If that's the word, I don't know, whatever the word is, I'll put that in the show notes too. Um, Please connect with him. Please support him. It's Joe DeLuna too at cash app. Put that. (laughs) Was it 1914? You get $19 and 14 cents. I would love, I would love $3 or $19 and 14 cents. Yes. But please do that. All those are welcome. So please put that in the show notes. Now, thank you so much, Positive Filter listeners. If you want to follow the podcast, it's uh, on Positive Filter on all platforms, or you can call the podcast hotline, which is 571-336-6560. That's 571-336-6560. Sharing positivities and movement, and we're out. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career with a little self-help along the way if you enjoyed this podcast please share it with your family and friends and like the facebook page spreading positivity of movement thanks for listening